A Book at Bedtime Exhalation by Ted Chiang Part 2 The first tool I constructed was the simplest. In my laboratory, I fixed four prisms on mounting brackets and carefully aligned them so that their apexes formed the corners of a rectangle. When arranged thus, a beam of light directed at one of the lower prisms was reflected up, then backward, then down, and then forward again in a quadrilateral loop. Accordingly, when I sat with my eyes at the level of the first prism, I obtained a clear view of the back of my own head. This solipsistic periscope formed the basis of all that was to come. A similarly rectangular arrangement of actuating rods allowed a displacement of action to accompany the displacement of vision afforded by the prisms. The bank of actuating rods was much larger than the periscope, but still relatively straightforward in design. By contrast with what was attached to the end of these respective mechanisms was far more intricate. To the periscope, I added a binocular microscope mounted on an armature capable of swiveling from side to side or up and down. To the actuating rods, I added an array of precision manipulators, although that description hardly does justice to those pinnacles of the mechanics art. Combining the ingenuity of anatomists and the inspiration provided by the bodily structures they studied, the manipulators enabled their operator to accomplish any task he might normally perform with his own hands, but on a much smaller scale. Assembling all this equipment took months, but I could not afford to be anything less than meticulous. Once the preparations were complete and I was able to place each of my hands on a nest of knobs and levers and control a pair of manipulators situated behind my head and use the periscope to see what they worked on, I would then be able to dissect my own brain. The very idea must sound like pure madness, I know, and I had told any of my colleagues they would surely have tried to stop me but I could not ask anyone else to risk themselves for the sake of anatomical inquiry and because I wish to conduct the dissection myself, I would not be satisfied by merely being the passive subject of such an operation. Auto dissection was the only option. I brought in a dozen full lungs and connected them with a manifold. I mounted this assembly beneath the work table that I would sit at and positioned a dispenser to connect directly to the bronchial inlets within my chest. This would supply me with six days worth of air. To provide for the possibility that I might not have completed my experiment within that period, I had scheduled a visit from a colleague at the end of that time. My presumption, however, was that the only way I would not have finished the operation in that period would be if I had caused my own death. I began by removing the deeply curved plate that formed the back and top of my head then the two more shallowly curved plates that form the sides. Only my face plate remained, but it was locked into a restraining bracket and I could not see it in the surface from the vantage point of my periscope. What I saw exposed was my own brain. It consisted of a, a dozen or more sub-assemblies whose exteriors were covered by intricately moulded shells. By positioning the periscope near the fissures that separated them, I gained a tantalising glimpse of the fabulous mechanisms within their interiors. Even with what little I could see, I could tell it was most beautifully complex, the most beautifully complex engine I had ever beheld, so far beyond any device man had constructed that it was incontrovertibly of divine origin. The sight was both exhilarating and dizzying. And I savoured it on a strictly aesthetic basis for several minutes before proceeding with my explorations. It was generally hypothesised that the brain was divided into an engine located in the centre of the head, which performed the actual cognition, surrounded by an array of components in which memories were stored. What I observed was consistent with this theory since the peripheral subassemblies seemed to resemble one another, while the subassembly in the centre appeared to be different, more heterogeneous, with more moving parts. However, the components were packed too closely for me to see much of their operation. If I intended to learn anything more, I would require a more intimate vantage point. <laughs>
Each sub-assembly had a local reservoir of air fed by a hose extending from the regulator at the base of my brain. I focused my periscope on the rearmost sub-assembly and using the remote manipulators, I quickly disconnected the outlet hose and installed a longer one in its place. I had practiced this maneuver countless times so that I could perform it in a matter of moments. Even so, I was not certain I could complete the connection before the sub-assembly had depleted its local reservoir. Only after I was satisfied that the component's operation had not been interrupted did I continue. I rearranged the longer hose to gain a better view of what lay in the fissure behind it, or the hoses that connected it to its neighbouring components. Using the most slender pair of manipulators to reach into the narrow crevice, I replaced the hoses one by one with longer substitutes. Eventually, I'd worked my way around the entire subassembly and replaced every connection it had to the rest of my brain. I was now able to unmount this subassembly from the frame that supported it and pull the entire section outside of what was once the back of my head. I knew it was possible I had impaired my capacity to think and was unable to recognise it, but performing some basic arithmetic tests suggest that I was uninjured. With one subassembly hanging from the scaffold above, I now had a better view of the cognition engine at the centre of my brain. There was not enough room to bring the microscope attachment itself in for close inspection. In order for me to really examine the workings of my brain, I would have to displace at least half a dozen sub-assemblies. Laboriously, painstakingly, I repeated the procedure of substituting hoses for other sub-assemblies repositioning another one further back, two more higher up and two others out to the sides, suspending all six from the scaffold above my head. When I was done, my brain looked like an explosion, frozen an infinitesimal fraction of a second after the detonation. And again, I felt dizzy when I thought about it. But at last, the cognition engine itself was exposed, supported on a pillar of hoses and actuating rods leading down to my torso. I now had room to rotate my microscope around the full 360 degrees and pass my gaze across the inner faces of the sub-assemblies I had moved. What I saw was a microcosm of auric machinery, a landscape of tiny spinning rotors and miniature reciprocating cylinders. As I contemplated this vista, I wondered, where was my body? The conduits which displaced my vision and action around the room were in principle no different to those which connected my original eyes and hands to my brain. For the duration of this experiment, were these manipulators not essentially my hands? Were the magnifying lenses at the end of my periscope essentially my eyes? I was an inverted person, a tiny fragmented body situated at the centre of my own distended brain. It was in this unlikely configuration that I began to explore myself. I turned my microscope to one of the memory sub-assemblies and began examining its design. I had no expectation that I would be able to decipher my memories, only that I might divine the means by which they were recorded. As I had predicted, there were no reams of foil pages visible, but to my surprise, neither did I see banks of gear wheels and switches. Instead, the subassembly seemed to consist of in, almost entirely of a bank of air tubules. Through the interstices between these tubules, I was able to glimpse ripples passing through the bank's interior. With careful inspection, increasing magnification, I discerned that the tubules rammed into tiny air capillaries, which were intero interwoven with a dense latticework of wires on which gold leaves were hinged. Under the influence of air escaping from the capillaries, the leaves were held in a variety of positions. These were not switches in the conventional sense. They did not retain their position without a current of air to support them. But I hypothesized that these were the switches I had saw, the medium in which my memories were recorded. The ripples I saw must have been acts of recall, as an arrangement of leaves was read and sent back to the cognition engine. 
Armed with this new understanding, I then turned my microscope to the cognition engine. Here too, I observed the lattice work of wires, but they did not bear leaves in suspended positions. Instead, the leaves flipped back and forth almost too rapidly to see. Indeed, almost the entire engine appeared to be in motion, consisting more of uh, lattice than of air capillaries. And I wondered how air could reach all the gold leaves in a coherent manner. For many hours, I scrutinized the leaves until I realized that they themselves were playing the role of capillaries. The leaves, they formed temporary conduits and valves that existed just long enough to redirect air at other leaves in turn and disappeared as a result. This was an engine undergoing continuous transformation, indeed, modifying itself as part of its operation. The lattice was not so much a machine as it was a page on which the machine was written, which the machine itself ceaselessly wrote. My consciousness could be said to be encoded in the position of these tiny leaves. But it would be more accurate to say that it was encoded in the ever shifting pattern of air driving these leaves. Watching the oscillations of these flakes of gold, I saw that air does not, as we had always assumed, simply provide power to the engine that realizes our thoughts. Air is in fact the very medium of our thoughts. All that we are, it's a pattern of airflow. My memories were inscribed not as grooves on foil or even the position of switches, but as persistent currents of argon. In the moments after I grasped the nature of this lattice mechanism, a cascade of insights penetrated my consciousness in rapid succession. The first and most trivial was understanding why gold is the most reliable tool, the most malleable and ductile of metals, the only material out of which our brains could be made. Only the thinnest foil of leaves could move rapidly enough for such a mechanism, and only the most delicate of filaments could act as hinges for them. In comparison, the copper burr raised by my stylus as I engrave these words and brushed from the sheet when I finish each page is as coarse and heavy as scrap. This truly was a medium where erasing and recording could be performed rapidly, far more so than any arrangement of switches and gears. What next became clear was why installing full lungs into a person who has died from lack of air does not bring him back to life. These leaves within the lattice remain balanced between continuous cushions of air. This arrangement lets them flip back and forth swiftly, but it also means that if the flow of air ever ceases, everything is lost. The leaves all collapse into identical pendant states, erasing the patterns and the consciousness they represent. Restoring the air supply cannot recreate what was ever nest. This was the price of speed. A more stable medium for storing patterns would mean that our consciousnesses would operate far more slowly. It was then that I perceived the solution to the clock anomaly. I saw that the speed of these leaves' movements depended on their being supported by air. With sufficient air flow, the leaves could move nearly frictionlessly. If they were moving more slowly, it was because they were being subjected to more friction, which could occur only if the cushions of air that supported them were thinner and the air flowing through the lattice was moving with less force. It is not turret clocks are running fast. What is happening is that our brains are running slower. The turret clocks are driven by pendulums whose tempo never varies or by the flow of mercury through a pipe which does not change. But our brains rely on the passage of air and when that air flows more slowly, our thoughts slow down, making the clocks seem to us to run faster. I had feared that our brains might be growing slower, and it was this prospect that had spurred me to pursue my auto deception. But I had assumed that our cognition engines, while powered by air, were ultimately mechanical in nature, and some aspect of the mechanism was gradually becoming deformed through fatigue and thus responsible for the slowing. That would have been dire, but there was at least the hope that we might be able to repair the mechanism and restore our brains to their original speed of operation. If our thoughts 
were purely patterns of air rather than the movement of tooth gears. The problem was much more serious. But what could cause the air flowing through every person's brain to move less rapidly? It could not be a decrease in the pressure from our filling stations dispensers. The air pressure in our lungs is so high that it must be stepped down by a series of regulators before reaching our brains. The diminution in force I saw must arise from the opposite direction. Pressure of the surrounding atmosphere was increasing. How could this be? As soon as the question formed, the only possible answer became apparent. Our sky must not be infinite in height. Somewhere above the limits of our vision, the chromium wall surrounding our world must curve inward to form a dome. Our universe is a sealed chamber rather than an open well, and air is gradually accumulating within that chamber until it equals the pressure in the reservoir below. This is why, at the beginning of this engraving, I said that air is not the source of life. Air can neither be created nor destroyed. The total amount of air in the universe remains constant, and if air were all that we needed to live, we would never die. But in truth, the source of life is a difference in air pressure. The flow of air from spaces where it is thick to those where it is thin. The activity of our brains, the motion of our bodies, the action of every machine we have ever built is driven by the movement of air. The force exerted is differing pressures seeking to balance each other out. When the pressure everywhere in the universe is the same, all air will be motionless and useless. One day we will be surrounded by motionless air and unable to derive any benefit from it. We are not really consuming air at all. The amount of air that I draw from each day's new pair of lungs is exactly as much as seeps out through the joints of my limbs and the seams of my casing. Exactly as much as I'm adding to the atmosphere around me. All I am doing is converting air at high pressure to air at low. Every movement of my body, I contribute to the equalization of pressure in our universe. Every thought that I have. I hasten the arrival of that fatal equilibrium. Had I come to this realization under any other circumstance, I would have leapt up from my chair and ran into the streets. But in my current situation, body locked in a restraining bracket, brain suspended across my laboratory, doing so was impossible. I could see the leaves of my brain flitting faster from the tumult of my thoughts, which in turn increased my agitation and being so restrained and immobile. Panic at that moment might have led to my death, a, a nightmarish paroxysm of simultaneously being trapped and spiralling out of control, struggling against my restraints until my air ran out. It was by chance as much as intention that my hands adjusted the controls to avert my periscopic gaze from the lattice work. So all I could see was the plain surface of my work table. Thus, freed from having to see, magnify my own apprehensions, I was able to calm down. When I had regained sufficient composure, I began the lengthy process of reassembling myself. Eventually, I restored my brain to its original compact configuration, reattached the plates of my head, Released myself from the restraining bracket. Good night. <laughs>